Hey there, welcome back. Uh, so I have continued on with my Dresden Files reread. I have already read all the series and now obviously we're rereading it again. Full Moon used to be, if not my least favorite of the Dresden Files, my second least favorite. It and Blood Rites uh, were fighting back and forth for which one I hate it more. And that seems to be the genuine consens consensus of the fans at large, like people say, push through the first two books and then you kind of get hooked into the series. Um, I still agree with that. However, upon reread, I think I like this more than Stormfront. And I can't, to, I, I can't believe I'm saying this. I enjoyed the reread of this more than Stormfront. And to anyone who is not a fan of this series, you can't understand how much saying that hurts me. Uh, Full Moon is pretty straightforward. You have all the pulpiness of the Dresden Files. Um, Dresden being your wizard's private detective, and he's being called in to consult on another murder case. Murphy is the police detective. Um, she's having some trouble with internal affairs after some fallout from the previous book where rumors have started that the drug organization was taken out by Harry on John Marcone's another drug lord crime boss's orders. Um, and because Murphy, the police detective, is often consulting with this psychic is what he's listed on as the books, some fallout is coming on her and she might lose her job. They might be going after Harry for relationships to John McCone. He might end up in jail. There's all that political stuff going on. I dislike this book so much initially because of how repetitive lines, like the same phrasing and words to explain the magic system, to explain Harry's personality, are used again from Stormfront in this book. So I, initially I read these books very close together because I love Stormfront so much. Um, and I hated it because like, why are we repeating the same information? Forgetting that initially the early books were almost set up to be standalone. You had an overarching plot that went through the series, but it was very, very subtle in these early books. Um, the early ones really could, you just pick it up and read from there and the context and information, everything you need to know would be contained in this book. So there is a repeating of the magic system, of plot information, character motivations, and lines to set up their personalities. Understanding that now, it's not so jarring and annoying for why I'm reading it a second time. The characters, of course, are fantastic. I love the, the humor of this, the introduction for this is not a fool uh this is not a um spoiler i'm pretty sure it doesn't say it on the back it, it says strange looking paw prints and a full moon i mean come on if you can't figure out werewolves from that and the title this book has werewolves so the introduction of them and the different types of werewolves there are three different ones explored here but it's implied that there are definitely others um it just expands the world expands the characters and finally starts to build the support system that Harry has moving forward into the series going on. Because Stormfront, like I said, he was alone. Now we are introducing his allies. He's gaining friends. He's making connections that will help him so much going forward in the series and just developing those relationships. We also name drop a couple important things in this book that while I don't believe Jim Butcher had fully thought out, I think I heard him in interviews, like I'd get an idea and I'd include it. And then it's like plant the seed so you could use it later on. Might not have it fully thought out when it first shows up, but I can, when you think of something in the future, hey, I can tie it back to this early book. So I really appreciated that. So we're now going to go into a full point by point, pretty much, plot synopsis of what happens here because I just want to talk about the Dresden Files. I don't care if anyone watches from here on out. I just want to tell you about the plot and if anyone wants to talk to me in the comments about the plot of the Dresden Files, please feel free. Just write spoilers if to keep anyone else safe. So we start with Kim. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about how it relates to themes of the series, but I'll try not to give any spoilers for future books. Uh, Kim is Harry's quote-unquote sort of apprentice. She is someone with mild magical talent and not a member of the White Council or anything like that. 
it is stated that Harry has helped children, your young teens, in the past who develop magic and need someone to help them and guide them in how to use it safely and properly. So Kim uh, asks Harry to meet her for lunch and he'll, she'll pay for her lunch because Harry's down on his luck, hasn't been getting very many cases from the police department, so can barely afford a meal. And she gives him this drawing with three rings in it. And she's asking him what these represent, what they're for. And she's saying it's strictly academic. She's not trying to summon anything. She just wants to know. Harry's having none of it. He says this is magic beyond your level. You are not ready for this. You shouldn't be looking into it. Again, she pleads. Like, just, it's academic interest only. I'm scratching an itch. Just tell me what they do. And he explains the outer one is for, I believe it was spiritual entities, like ghosts and creatures from the never-never. And the inner one is for mortal and physical, including, so humans and like rocks and bullets. But the third of the summoning circles, which again, summoning circles kind of keep something in or keep something out, acts like a barrier and a wall. The last one, however, is what he really doesn't want to tell her. It's for entities that are neither entirely spiritual, neither mortal. It's like the demigods of the supernatural world. Um, creatures and demons who can be summoned to earth, but then obtain flesh themselves. And it's extremely dangerous. He does not want to tell her anything. And he refuses to tell her how to power the circle or give her the information that she really needs. And she leaves angrily. Next, uh, Murphy comes in. Our... Okay, I don't like Murphy, okay? I don't, she's a fan favorite. I am not a fan of Detective Murphy at all. She comes in. This is the book I, is the reason that I don't like her, by the way, and I hold it against her for like the next 10 books. Uh, she comes in and barely apologizes or explains to Harry why she hasn't been in contact with him and why she's not giving him any cases and takes him to a crime scene at a town, I think bordering on her jurisdiction. I don't actually remember if she has jurisdiction here. So there is someone's been murdered uh, associated with John Marcone, and it becomes pretty obvious that we're dealing with werewolves. Murphy even specifically asks, like, hey, are werewolves real? And Harry's like, of course they're real. So we got bloody paw prints, there's the full moon, the like clawed tore apart body. And Murphy explains that there have been a number of killings, all with a wolf theme, but the FBI is involved and they don't actually believe that it's wolves. They think it's um, a group of people using like wolf teeth weapons, leaving ceremonial paw prints around, or, like ritualistic kind of killings. And Harry's like, all right, he takes a shard of glass with some blood on it from the crime scene before the FBI show up and we meet Agent Denton. Yeah, Denton. I keep wanting to say Deacon, I don't know why. Anyway, Agent Denton. And another Agent Ben's a little bit of confrontation ensues as he kicks them out of the crime scene. And they're on their way home, they're being followed on their way back. And Murphy explains the whole, hey, IA investigation, I'm under investigation for the stuff that happened before, my relationship with you and your alleged association with John Marcone. Harry's like, I'm not working for him, I never was, I never will blah, 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 back and forth. They just got to be careful because of all these investigations going on. Harry promised her because her issue is that he is not trusting her with information. Keep in mind, he also didn't trust Kim with information. Granted, she was a child or young teen, but that's Harry's big thing for these early books. He's not trusting his allies and his friends and the people he works with, people he associates with, with this knowledge because he knows that this knowledge is powerful and can get you hurt. So he apologizes for Murphy for not trusting her with the information in the last book. And again, he promises her that he will not do anything with her. He will come to her with information and he's just going to work tonight to get a full page report on what werewolves are and all the information that she needs and for eight o'clock tomorrow morning. Then he immediately breaks his promise, uses the blood to track down uh, the owner of the blood, someone who crashed through the window, um, to an abandoned storm, no, uh, abandoned storefront department store kind of thing, where he sees a woman and a group of teenagers, college kids, all dressed in like black leather, talking and they're arguing about probably the murders and what's going on. 
Lights go out, he gets caught, someone disarms him, he's on the run, he runs into Detective Murphy, who both are just like, what the hell, you went without me, and it's like, well, so did you. And Murphy explains she knew they were being followed from the crime scene, found them there, Harry explains that, yeah, I traced the blood here. And from there on, they go their separate ways to figure out what, what information they can. Harry goes back to his apartment or his house, to start uh, making some potions and to get all the information on werewolves that he needs. So we get some expansion on the world. Bob tells us about Hexen wolves, um, loop gurus, and just regular shapeshifters. Your regular shapeshifters being humans who are sort of like wizards in the sense that they learn one spell, how to turn themselves into a wolf, and how to turn back. We got a little bit of explanation on world building where Bob explains uh, probably originated in medieval kind of France, where if you were a starving farmer and you had the opportunity to put on a nice fur coat and go out hunting, then it's definitely an advantageous thing to do. He also explains it's difficult because you go in shapeshifter form, you keep your human mind, which means you're essentially used to being a sight-oriented biped and you've changed into a scent-oriented quadruped. So you almost have to learn how to do everything all over again. So early shapeshifters are not very good in their wolf form. They're still learning how to control it. Whereas a um, loop guru is a monster who has been cursed. Someone else has put that curse on them and forcing them to turn into the full moon. Those are the ones that require the silver bullet to kill. Every other form uh, can be killed just like a normal wolf. Um, it's also important to know that the loop guru, it has to be a special type of silver. It has to be inherited from a family member's silver. So you can't just go grab a, any old silver spoon, melt it down, make a bullet. You had to gain it from a family member. Uh, then there's the Hexen wolves who are people who made a bargain with some entity, normally a demon, to get the power to shapeshift into a wolf. And they, uh... They often turn more feral, more into wolves, lose control eventually, and don't really retain their humanity. I think there's another type of wolf. Give me one second. Oh, yeah. Uh, lycanthropes or something. I'll put the word on. I don't know how to say it right now. Uh, those are the beings who their mind transforms into a wolf, so they become more feral, more powerful, quicker healing and all that, but their body remains human, so they don't actually physically transform. So having all that uh, knowledge uh, and taking it to Murphy, he finds Susan at the uh, police station. I love Susan. I love Susan so much. Uh, that's Harry's not quite 100% girlfriend, but they're more or less in a relationship. They definitely care for each other. A little bit bickering back and forth. She's a reporter, knows a bit supernatural, and wants more information from Harry. Harry's like, hey, can't tell you. Police investigation, tight-lipped. No. So he goes to Murphy's office, she's in there with internal affairs, and he runs into um, Agent Denton again with the FBI and is given a heads up, hey, she's in there with internal affairs, it'll really make her look bad if you just walk in, why don't you give me the report and I'll put it on her desk for you. You can call her and let her know I'm dropping it off. It just really bad internal affairs sees you meeting with her. So we're like, okay, Deaton, not that bad of a guy. We're, he respects Murphy, he knows she's on the up and up. Okay, hands file, leaves. Uh, then one of the FBI agents meets up with Harry and turns him on to a local street gang, um, something wolves, street wolves, I don't know, uh, led by a guy named Parker. So Harry goes to investigate that. It's a different group than the ones that we met at the department store. And it's very clear that, that these are the lycanthropes, the ones who don't really transform, but their mind kind of goes crazy. And Parker is losing control of them as he's gotten a bit older. And the fact that he kind of let Harry get away makes him look weak. So now Parker's like, well, I have to kill Harry. And I have to do it myself or my pack's going to turn on me and kill me. So now Harry has another enemy. Next, we introduce my favorite side character again. John Marcone is waiting in Harry's office when he gets home or comes to the office. Uh, Harry's like, what the hell are you doing here, scumbag? Get out of my office. And John McCone's like, relax, I'm here to talk. And Harry's still like, get the hell out. Uh, we've just come so far from that first encounter last book where Harry is terrified in John's car and is just like, I'm in here with the most deadly man in Chicago, the biggest crime boss. 
uh, how do I get out of this alive and still can't help but insult him. Now it's just like straight insults. Anyhow, John's just like, I'm here to offer you a job. And he presents him with a legal contract that just says work for me. I think it's minimum five hours uh, a month. And the price is a blank space, like fill in your salary. I will pay you whatever you want. You work for me five hours a month. There's an actual clause in there saying you will not be asked to do any illegal activity. And Harry's just like, shove it. And like, he can't afford to buy a meal at McAnally's. And he's given a blank check. And he turns it down. And John's like, is it the hours? Do you want one hour a week? Do you want one hour a month? Like, tell me what you want. It's yours. I need someone on my staff who knows about this supernatural stuff, who's experienced, well, um, yeah, just knowledgeable on the supernatural. He needs someone in his corner. And Harry realizes, hey, this uh, monster is probably coming after you. It's going after all your associates, and you're looking for extra security in me. And John's just like, are you going to sign the contract or not? Harry tells him to shove it again. <laughs> Let me, uh, John's response being, John states, if we were in public, Mr. Dresden, I'd have you killed for speaking to me in this way. Harry responds, if we were in public, you'd try. Now get the hell out of my office. Just John's interest in Harry and Harry's distaste for him is prevalent throughout the story whenever they interact. And I love when they interact so much. Um, uh, where do we go from there? Harry then captures a, de or summons, he doesn't capture, summons a demon and puts it in a circle, one of the summoning circles. This demon is Chauncey or... I wrote down his actual name. Oh, we're not pronouncing that. Chanzagaroth. Chan 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 um, this is a demon that Harry has dealt with in the past and is very knowledgeable and just courteous of the rules. They have a decent banter back and forth and it gives him some information on the killings in exchange for one of Harry's names. Remember, Harry's full name is Harry Blackstone Copperfield Dresden. You need someone's full name from their own lips to really have much power over them. And Harry has a lot of enemies, especially on the White Council, people who summon this Chauncey guy and who could potentially want to harm Harry. So giving this demon too many of his names is extremely dangerous. After this interaction, Chauncey now has three of Harry's names. So if he gets that fourth, we're in trouble. Now, John had given Harry a little bit of advice telling him to look into a man named Mackina no, Mac McNeil, McNeil uh, as well as the Northwest Passage Project. So that is the information that the, he asks the demon for. And we learned that this is a rich businessman guy who is looking to buy up land to create like a nature preserve in the Northwest going up towards the Rocky Mountains kind of thing. And it's very good for environmental stuff, but a bunch of businessmen, including one who was killed and was partnered with John Marcone, um, was one of the victims of the animals, tax killers. Um, then we get a little bit more information from Chauncey. It's just like, hey, um, if you want more information, we also got, I got something on your mother and her past. And Harry's like, how the hell do you know my mother? And we learned that she definitely has a dark past and apparently the dark prince was after her and, but lost her in the end. And there was a supernatural death to both of Harry's parents. And Harry's just like, what the hell are you talking about? My dad died of an aneurysm in his sleep and my mom died in childbirth. And Chauncey's like, for another name, I'll tell you more. And Harry realized like he's being played. He needs to get out of this and sends the demon back. Oh, um, Chauncey also mentions that Harry likely has more family members alive. And again, hey, for another name, I'll tell you who and where they are. And Harry sends it back. Uh, Murphy then calls and says, hey, we got another body come to this address. The address being the one the demon just gave him for this McNeil. Uh, he goes to the address and he finds Murphy at the crime scene where Kim is. Kim being the sort of apprentice from earlier in the book and she has, is deceased, body ripped apart, animal attacked, just like all the others. And in front of her, I think even in chalk is all it is, is that three ring summoning circle. And Harry realized, like, if he had been there with her, if he had helped her, or if he had trusted her with the information she needed, 
there is a chance she will be alive right now. And he is devastated. He feels so responsible for this young girl's death. He's, he's barely able to talk. He doesn't know what to say. Uh, Murphy is being extremely cold to him and brings him to another room where they find the same three ring summoning circle, but it's made in like steel or I don't know, some kind of hard metal built into the concrete, but it's been destroyed. Someone hacked it apart and damaged the summoning circles, making it a pointless barrier. So Harry realizes that McNeil is actually a loop guru. So someone cursed a turn all the time. Um, another point to remember, the loop guru, um, there was a Catholic saint who specifically cursed. We learned this information from the Dima. Um, and in addition to being cursed a turn, it's a family curse. So passed on through the generations. And it's also part of the curse that it'll never end. It'll go to the beginning of time. So there will always be a child to inherit this curse. Uh, then they think Murphy reveals to Harry that he, that she knew that Kim was in a, or had some connection to Harry. Gives him that piece of paper that she had picked up back at the diner at the beginning of the book, had seen Kim leave, and is just like, you've been lying to me again. And she is again pissed and does not give him the chance to explain. So she immediately arrests him. I hate Murphy. So drags him out in handcuffs, leaves him in the back of the car as the FBI arrive and is just like, let's just deal with this and we'll take him back to the station. A woman then breaks Harry out of the car. This is Tara. She's the woman from the department store and they take off running. They shoot at Harry and get him in the shoulder as he's fleeing and some mist and stuff needs to happen to get away. Uh, go to, Harry passes out because, you know, shocked, tired. Tara wakes him up in a hotel room and they're like, she's like, come on, we got to go. And you got to help me with my fiance. So McNeil is her fiance. And he's asking about the pack of wolves there who are known as the alphas. And she's like, don't worry about us. Just help me find my fiance. You need to hold him. You, the full moon's about to happen again. I need you to create the, the three summoning circles to hold him so he doesn't kill anyone. He doesn't want to hurt anybody. And so Harry goes with her after a little bit of back and forth and banter. They find McNeil at the same time, pretty much, that the FBI and Murphy show up. McNeil, Tara, and him all take off running, and it's McNeil who ends up getting taken. Murphy ends up bringing him back to the police station. Murphy, who knows werewolves exist, believes werewolves exist, knows that this guy had some kind of prison looking thing in his home. I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt that she didn't know that those three rings were a containment kind of field to keep him locked in. But quite honestly, I think she should have figured that part out. Brings this suspect of the killing to the police precinct with the full moon hours away. I don't even think it's hours away. It's not long. I am blaming her for every single death that happens. We then have one of the best action fights in the early season or series of the books. Harry arrives at the police station, takes a potion that kind of blends him into the background. So he can be able to sneak past everyone because he's technically supposed to be under arrest. And Harry is too late. He tur um, McNeil turns. He kills the prisoners in the cell. He attacks the guards. Numerous police officers and prisoners and just people in this building are savagely killed. Uh, Murphy shows up. And the fact that she gets between Harry and this rampaging monster and starts shooting at him with bullets she made out of inherited silver, because again, she believes in werewolves. Um, almost taking him out does not redeem her in my eyes. I blame her for every death here. Uh, it is then Rudolph who uh, takes Harry uh, away to get him to, to take him away from the scene to figure something out to how to stop this monster. If you are caught up in the series, Yes, it is that Rudolph. May he burn in hell. 
Um, so Harry comes up with a plan. He gets some of the creature's blood, attaches it to like a Snoopy doll, and his plan is to use the Snoopy doll to bind the creature, bind its eyes, ears, effectively containing it for the night. He is not able to get there before the creature comes at uh, Detective Murphy, and it is Carmichael who gets in the way. Carmichael being Murphy's partner from the first book, just generally good guy, looking out, doesn't really like Harry, thinks he's a con artist, but we know he's a good guy. Carmichael dies. It is genuinely really, really, really sad. This almost nothing character with just a few lines of dialogue is killed protecting Murphy. Harry performs a spell, blasts the creature through multiple walls and out the building, and then binds um, his eyes and ears and all that in his mouth so he can't do any harm for the night. Everyone is distraught. Most of these people didn't really believe in the supernatural, so they're just in a daze. No one knows what's going on. Murphy's got her arm broke. She's crying over her partner's dead body. Everyone's in shock. No one stops Harry when he stumbles out of the building. Uh, Tara and Susan grab him, and they just leave the scene. We then meet Harry's subconscious for the first time. Harry passes out in the back of the car. When he come, He's kind of coming to in this black room, and there's another version of him there. His subconscious and him have a little bit back and forth and is explaining that uh, you're missing something, you have to listen to me, and you have that all just summarizing what is going on in the story so far. When Harry comes to, Tara informs them that they're being followed. And Harry wants to get Susan and Tara out of danger, and he's honestly just royally pissed off. So he does one of my favorite scenes, tells them to get off the freeway, and as they're going on the exit ramp, he opens the door, tucks and rolls, has a very bad landing, his face in the dirt. It's not, it's not a good look for him and stands up and then just blows the tires off the car that's following them. It's Parker and the other street wolves, I think is their group name, uh, come out and they get into a fight. Harry at first has the upper hand, but he's used too much of his magic. The potions are all wearing off and he's unable to take them out. So he gets kidnapped and captured. He sees some things and ends up putting together what's actually going on. So he wakes up in a warehouse with Parker and his subordinates interrogate him and they explain that they would have already killed them except John Marcone made a call and says, nope, you're going to hand Harry over to me. And they're just like, John Marcone, he's human. Why is he ordering us around? We're like in throats, basically savage monsters. You can't, why are we taking orders from him? And they're like, dude, it's John Marcone. We're, we're going to hear what he has to say. He says, keep this guy alive until he gets here. We're going to listen to him. So John Marcone shows up. Harry has freed himself from his bindings, but still pretending that he's tied up. So John Marcone again offers Harry the contract. Signed contract, work with me, and I will get you out of here. If not, I will leave you with them to be killed. Harry once again says, go to hell. Parker gets upset. It's like, no, if I don't kill him, then my pack's going to kill me. They're going to think I'm weak. I'm not giving him to you. John Marcone's just like, you don't have to worry about it. There's no need for us to get into a fight. He's too stubborn to take my offer. I just kind of want to offer it one last time. And Harry's just like, you know what? Give me a pen. I'll sign your contract. John looks at him like, what, what are you playing? I don't believe you, but here's a pen. This does exactly what Harry knew it would. Parker gets upset. They get into a fight, giving Harry the opportunity to run. He runs right into the FBI agents, agents uh, Denton and his uh, two or three goons, all wearing wolf pouch belt things. They are hex and wolves. So they have made a deal with some kind of demon to gain the power to shapeshift. And they try to kill Harry along with Parker and the goons. So we got a three-way fight between the two different types of werewolves and Marcone and his men. Harry is running and hiding, just hoping that they'll overlook him and he'll find a chance to get away. It is Tara and the Alphas, the ones from the department store, who come and save him and get him out. Um, on the escape route, we run into Susan again, who explains, well, I was the only one old enough to rent a van for the getaway. So she's the getaway driver for these group of teenage college kids 
new werewolf shapeshifters and this unknown woman who we've established is not even human. Uh, Tara's just like, you promised me you would help my fiance. I had to save you so you can help my fiance. And they all go back to one of the alphas. Her name is Georgia. Her parents are out of town, I think in Italy. So they're good to stay, stay there as long as they clean up the blood afterwards. We get lots of interactions through, well, not lots. We get like two interactions between Georgia and Billy, both here and earlier at the department store. They were arguing at the department store, but they're kind of like caring for each other here. We love Georgia and Billy. We love them so much. I love them so much. Um, Harry is talking to Billy and Billy reminds him of, as a younger version of himself, someone who knows that, that the supernatural is real, real, has taken on some amount of power and therefore the responsibility to help people throwing his own words back at him like I have this power how can I not do anything to help so you have to let us go with you to help Harry's just like you are college kids you are children no you are not coming with me to fight a loop guru John Marcone and the FBI agents that are turning into werewolves no I'm not taking you with me and they're like yes you are because we can help you need our help we're not going to stand by and Harry's just like, you will do everything I say. And if I tell you to run, you run. They're like, cool. There's a genuinely sweet moment between Harry and Susan and their relationship. Uh, Susan gives him a new jacket, nice black and leather or dark leather. And they go off to John Marcone's house because they know that um, the loop guru, uh, McFinn, who is the fiance of Tara, thinks that John Marcone is the one who set him up for these murders and is going after Marcone. And the FBI agents are going to be there because they want to take out everybody. Uh, at one point, Harry had taken one of the FBI agents hostage for a short time and got the story out of them. Uh, the FBI agents were tired of people like Marcone going, getting away with murder and being above the line or getting away with so many things that they took this power to be able to stop them. And it just, it's kind of been getting out of hand. Um, throwing even Harry's words back at him. Like we have this power, we have to use it to stop criminals. And Harry's just like, well, I don't agree with your methods. So they're all converged on Marcone's house. The alphas get in one way and Harry goes over fence the other way, but they, he, the wolves are supposed to meet, circle around and meet up with Harry and they never do. So Harry goes looking and he sees that Marcone's men have tranquilized all the wolves and the FBI agents are there with him. So they have convinced Marcone that they're there to protect him and stop this rampaging monster that's coming after Marcone. Harry eventually tries to tell Marcone that, hey, you know, the FBI agents are actually the villains. And Marcone's like, why should I believe you? Deaton ends up capturing Harry and... Uh, Murphy, who had come as well, had pieced some things together and also knocks out Marcone and shoots Hendrix. Pissed me off. I love Hendrix. Hendrix being Marcone's bodyguard. Uh, so they all get thrown into a pit with, so it's the Alphas and Tara. Um, Harry and Murphy are all in this deep pit at the bottom and John's like dangling over the edge just past a platform. Uh, he's the bait to get the loop through to come in. And uh, Harry takes this moment to, I gotta get the words again. Harry asked Marcone, so Harry asked Marcone if, hey, do you believe me now that Deaton was trying to kill you? Uh, Marcone's response, yes. Do tell me that you told me so with your last dying breath, Mr. Dresden. I just love their interactions so much. Um, Marcone then pulls a hidden knife and cuts down this net that had his, was his plan to capture the loop through, but only knocks down one rope, so it goes down to the pit, allowing Harry to climb out and escape. It's Tara who transforms to fight her fiancé, and her, between her skills and just not being human, outmaneuvers the loop through and leads him off into the distance to distract him. Harry ends up having to fight the FBI agents. In doing so, he knows he needs more power. His magic has kind of failed him. He's too exhausted and takes one of the wolf skin belts and transforms himself. The descriptions of him in wolf form, him losing his mind, giving over to this beast, the way he talks, 
is such a drastic shift it is momentarily like terrifying like this is not the Harry we know and love this is a monster that has taken over and this is Harry's first transformation the FBI agents have been doing it for so long that they're not even human anymore so when it happens in all this fighting and bloodlust the FBI agents just kind of turn on each other and end up killing themselves um, their friends and teammates they wipe themselves out leaving only Denton there's a fight between Harry and Dresden I'm oh, sorry Harry and Denton and Harry is about to finish him off in this wolf form when Susan comes my sweet sweet Susan she sh pretty much snaps him out of it he has to choose her and humanity and just turn away from this rage and power just like no take off the belt get me out of here all right so Susan gets the alphas and Tara to safety and then Murphy decides to open her mouth and cement my hatred for her for the next 10 books. She's still questioning whether or not Harry is in the right if he's innocent. I, I don't know the logic. It's just like, just because these people are trying to kill you doesn't mean that you're not also involved, that you weren't lying and hiding things from me. It, it just honestly doesn't make sense and it's very annoying. There is a final confrontation as Harry uses his amulet to his, with, to his mother's made of silver to take down the through and Murphy apparently redeems herself and shows that she always trusted Dresden by shooting Deaton as, or Denton, I, keep, I hate his name, uh, just as he's coming to, to about to finish off Dresden. Susan, my sweet girl, um, being the reporter that she is, filmed all this and caught most of it on video before the magic kind of zapped out her camera, gets a promotion at work, puts it on the local news, and then eventually the video goes missing because governments, and of course it did, and everyone thinks it's a hoax. Um, Harry and Murphy burn the wolf skin belt, and Harry's left thinking, hey, these, that sorcerer warlock from six months ago and now these belts popping up and someone telling the FBI agents about the White Council because they had initially wanted to frame Parker and his group to be take the fall for the police and then set up McNeil for the White Council to blame everything on. Like who told them about this? What's going on? Is someone trying to kill me? Is someone causing trouble? Just what's up? So we're setting up things for future books. Overall, I had a blast with this reread. Five stars. There were less red flags in this book than Stormfront. I got one, two, three, four, five moments I disliked, two of which were not even sexual in nature, really. It was Harry being a nice guy, and I forget what the other one oh yeah someone like reading porn that was just like was that really necessary to be included so dress about them tell them to mark every anytime something unnecessarily sexual pops up so I just know how often it happens and the other like three were like a paragraph or a sentence that was just like Ugh, does that really need to be said or included definitely like two right next to each other at the end I'm like you don't need to do this so really not bad in the, my main complaint of the series being how overly sexualized all these characters are. I had a blast with this book. I'm having a blast with this reread. Um, for future of going to, into the series, there's a little bit of a theory I've seen between Tara and McNeil. McNeil unfortunately did die, so, but his line could not have ended because of the curse. So I'm interested to see if something pans out on who the child is between him and Tara. Tara end up transforming into a wolf more permanently and going off to be with her family. She says she won't be back, but we'll see. Harry has a bonding moment with the alphas. They invite him to go camping. They, he, they become friends and go on like playing D&D. It's just so sweet. Harry is forming the relationships that will be the heart and soul of the series. Murphy is no longer as annoying as she is in this book going forward. It just takes me time to forgive her. I am super, super excited. There was also, what was it? There's a name drop of one of the organizations where I can never pronounce their name. They start with a V. It doesn't matter. I'll put the name up here. 
Um, they're a secret organization, but they have like a public face that are allied with the White Council. So that name gets name dropped in book two. And I'm very impressed with this. I don't know if this was a Jim Butcher had something thought out from the beginning or it was, hey, let me just include a name as maybe just a throwaway statement. And if it, if I need an organization in later books, I can relate it back to this one just to have something to connect early in later books when maybe he didn't have everything 100% thought out or maybe it was 100% thought out. Either way, I love it. I love Full Moon. I don't know how that happens. I hated this book the first time I read it. So I'm so happy that I loved it for this reread. Read it in a day. Highly recommend. This is all I got. I'm rambling near the end. See ya.